This episode of the Lab Science Podcast is sponsored by Turner Mixing House. Founded by Ben Turner in Nashville, Tennessee, Turner Mixing House is the mixing solution for all of your recording post-production needs. With a dedicated team capable of tackling any task across the full spectrum of the record-making process. Whether you're established, upcoming, or somewhere in between, Turner Mixing House can provide a full mix, edit a vocal or drum track, and even polish up your demo. Turner Mixing House gives recording artists the best bang for their buck. And as a bonus for all new clients, you'll receive a 15% discount on your first project. Contact Turner Mixing House on Facebook, Twitter, or visit them at turnermixinghouse.com. Again, that's turnermixinghouse.com. Welcome to Lab Science, the number one podcast covering music production, business, songwriting, and studio technique. I'm your host, Professor Sense. Lean Automatico. I am very excited today. You know, over the last two episodes, we've been nerding out over synthesizers. Uh, so a lot of the audio engineer heads have been asking us when we're going to switch topics. And today is that day. In today fact, day. today we're going to talk completely about mixing, mastering, studio techniques, tips that can get your mix sounding better. We're going to talk about compression, EQing, panning tips, balancing tips, reverb, distortion, all of that good stuff. Uh, so grab a piece of paper, grab a pen. There's probably going to be a lot of things you want to write down. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Lab Science POD and on Instagram at Lab Science Podcast. All right. This is also the first week we'll be reporting live from iTunes. So if you haven't yet, subscribe to us in the iTunes podcast app by searching for Lab Science. Woo! All right. Now, before we get started, let's start up the lab report. And today I wanted to talk about three topics that I saw in the news this week that I think are kind of appropriate for the, the music scene. The first one for our DJ homies, Rain. Uh, big Rain. Big Rain. Um, Rain is one of the more popular mixer companies in the DJ market. You know, you're, you're probably a bigger Rain user than I am. Yep. Serato, Lovers, get your 57s, your 62s, the new MP 2015. Apparently Rain has just been sold uh, to a company called In Music. Uh, I didn't see this coming. Me neither. And, you know, I, I've seen rain shit in, in clubs to this day. It seemed like they were doing really fine. But apparently this company has been buying up a lot of other big DJ companies. So they own Denon. They own Newmark. They also own Akai. That's dope. And uh, the way they've run the, the business model, they, they kind of take the schematics of the products and then they replace the parts with cheaper products from Asia. That's uh, not dope. That's not so dope. That's um, not dope. I'm always about bringing the price point down, but when you talk about Rain, Rain is an American company built on high parts. Yeah. So to kind of take both of the core aspects away from the company, I wonder what they're doing there. You can't compromise the components of stuff like this. Yeah, definitely. Especially Akai. I mean, like, those are my favorite pads. Right. They better not change the pads. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I guess the biggest tip right now is if you're a Rain fan, grab the stock while it's on the shelves because the circuitry might be changing up really, really soon. I will say this, though. Uh, now that I'm really thinking about it, Akai and Denon have just recently put out a lot of product for Serato. True. Like Akai has got the uh, they got like a launch key. They got like a, a new controller that you can use. Yeah, that's similar to some of the, the some of the modular and stuff. tractor stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's it's similar to the uh, the F one and yeah. the X one controller. Yeah, and then they have a Denon Serato box that's like the size of your back pocket. So I wonder if this is really just you know in music looking at the opportunity to kind of consolidate all the Serato players. Yeah, as far as Newmark, I'm not sure where they're really trying to go with that. I mean, I mean, it could be one of those things where yeah. let's just get this competition off of the market before Actually, it's a problem. Yeah, the Newmark uh, digital DJ controllers. The Mixtrack Pro. Yeah, they're definitely Serato. I, but Newmark kind of goes either way. Yeah, it's an, it's an open controller format. But again, maybe that's what InMusic is trying to do. Yeah. Maybe they're taking all these open controllers and trying to internalize them under the Serato umbrella. Yeah, because I know that uh, Kai and Denon have definitely gone a more Serato route, and obviously Rain yeah. uh, loves Serato as well. It'll be really interesting to see how this plays out. It kind of makes Pioneer the only you know, other player if you're using Serato at this point. Yeah, Pioneer is still a free, flat, free uh, platform. You can use Tractor or Serato, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. 
So, I mean, I don't know. Again, if you're a fan of those range scratch mixers especially, you know, as delicate as crossfaders can get, grab them while they're the stock that yeah. you know. I mean, that 57, I mean, my instructor was uh, DJ Precision. Shout out to Precision. Big Precision from the X-Men. And to this day, he'll be like, I love the Rain 57 mixer. Yo, don't touch the 57 mixer. Like all that, you know, so. Yeah. It's a big deal. It's weird, man. It's weird. So the next thing I want to touch on, this is so long overdue, New York tax credit. Um, so it was recently reported the New York Assembly and Senate have passed the Empire State Music Production Tax Credit. So if this is signed into law, which it should be uh, by Governor Cuomo, you can expect a 25 percent tax credit in New York City and a 35 percent tax credit for upstate if you're doing anything related to music production. That's huge. So this is studio fees, mixing and mastering costs, transportation, your videos. Um, equipment rental. Equipment rental. That's big. Anything related to the producing music process. Uh, this is huge. Um, they, they did something similar with the movie industry in New York maybe a few years ago. It's been going really well. You're seeing a lot more cinema come out of New York. Um, but I guess the first question that comes to mind is why is this happening all of a sudden? Uh, Kanye? <laughs> <laughs> Told him about how I wanted to help the world and he said he'd help me and then I blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Um, I think it kind of it kind of alludes to two things. One, the more obvious that everyone is kind of doing their own home production thing and everyone's a producer now, so it's a yeah. big market. But I think it's also New York admitting that artists are leaving New York. It's becoming mm. more and more difficult to afford New York rent yeah. and be a music producer. Um, so that 25% is going to be huge. What does it mean for you? You need to save your receipts. Yeah, definitely save your receipts. <laughs> um, Get those email receipts. Go paperless. Absolutely. Never have to hold on to a piece of paper again. Absolutely. You know, when, when legislation like this goes into place, there's usually a lot of confusion in the first year or two. So you want to keep really good records. If you're taking, you know, if you're getting a Metro car to go to band rehearsal, keep that receipt. Yeah. If you're taking a client out to lunch to discuss mixing, keep that receipt. And while this all gets figured out, you can make sure that you have the evidence you need to get your credit. Getting a quarter of your money back as a musician that's is crazy it's unheard of yeah you we spend a lot of money the recording process is an expensive process well, maybe not us i mean we we try our best <laughs> to kind of cut costs you know we're fortunate enough to be mixing on our own and mastering on our own but even just like transportation you know mm -hmm. and 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 you know the time that goes into it it definitely. could be spent in other ways if we have that 25 percent coming back so definitely take advantage of that billboard has a really great article on it we'll link to that in the podcast so the last thing I wanted to cover before we start dishing out tips, Apple's looking at buying Tidal. That they're like, yo, we're putting <laughs> a stop to this madness. <laughs> no more releasing albums only on Tidal. Yeah, I mean, that's, Kanye designer. That was really the kicker. Yeah, and I think that you know that's a huge thing to talk about with regards to current culture. Apple's but the big beast. Kanye's album did become available on Apple. It eventually did, and even that that in itself. Or uh, but maybe a couple of weeks later, even. Yeah, yeah. But I think that even says how important having the exclusive is to this current generation. Yeah. I mean, with everyone on their ADD shit, if that release isn't in your hands in the first couple of days, you kind of don't think about it anymore. Yeah. So as Tidal started to rack in all of these exclusive, it, it made it really hard for Apple to, to kind of counter it. They had Drake. Yeah. But I mean, everyone was going to listen to Drake anyway, so that didn't matter so much. I don't understand why they didn't just do this off the jump. I mean, this is uh, Jay Z's company, right? I think he's still a part of the process. I'm at sure. The, at the very least, on an advisory level, you see the title concerts he's doing and stuff. Yeah. But I think that Jay Z association is kind of like the nail on the head. It's what team has the cool kids on it. Yeah. And Apple couldn't really compete with the likes of having a Jay Z exclusive. This is a public service announcement. Beyonce exclusive. That's true. Um, we're really hitting a new era. When you have companies kind of bowing to what I call the street culture mm -hmm. more than anything else. Definitely. I think this uh, tactic of releasing strictly to a certain platform is kind of underground. It's like a guerrilla movement to me because it's, it's kind of like what we do with Black Space. Like, for instance, you know, you can only get some of our content on certain platforms yeah. for a certain amount of time yeah. before we release it. Otherwise, like, for instance, the Ingrid video. Yeah. You can only catch it on. You can only listen to that song and watch that video on YouTube. It's right. not anywhere else right now. It's a control thing. It's I mean, I don't know. It's almost like they're the new labels. Yeah. You know, the I, platforms themselves, the platforms themselves, at mm -hmm. least if they're not that now, I guarantee in five years, that'll be the way we look at these. SoundCloud music. Oh, yeah. They're going to be the new labels. It's crazy, crazy stuff. All right. Well, that's the lab report. Again, we would love to hear your questions for next week. So if you'd like to reach out to us, 
Hit us on Twitter at Lab Science POD and on Instagram at Lab Science Podcast. We're going to take a quick break and come back with some mixing tips. <sighs> All right, guys, before we jump deep into this mixing discussion, we have a few questions from our listeners. This first one comes from Greg from St. Louis, Missouri. And he asks, when you're mixing a rap song that has an 808 and a rapper with a really deep voice, how do you make room for each on a track? Oh, the deep end. This is a question I get a lot. I think it's always it, a problem. Yeah. 808 is in 95% of trap songs right now. And if you have a deep voice, you're competing with an 808. It's, Definitely. It's really hard. Um, one tip that I learned uh, really early on working with hardware EQs is the boost one cut the other trick. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the vocal and the bass. You find the frequency that sounds the best in the bass's low end, and you boost it a little bit. Yeah. In the vocal, you cut in that very same frequency. Nice. Now you go into the vocal, you find that low end frequency that sounds really good in the vocal, and you raise that a little bit. You cut that out of the bass frequency. Mm -hmm. So you've really carved in space for each of these things to sit at the bottom and not compete with each other. Nice. Um, it takes a lot of tuning. You want to like, tune into the frequency of the, the key of the song, but I think it goes a long, long way. There's also uh, one technique I learned. It was the add, remove, replace. So hmm. in a spectrum, you know, you have your EQ, your band, um, however many, you know, bands, you however many notches you have on there. You go in, you find a frequency that you either really like or really don't like. Yeah. Bring it all the way up. Yep bring the gain of it all the way up so you can really hear it, move it around, see where that, you know, find the spectrum, then remove it completely. Yep. See how it sounds. Then slowly, gradually bring it back up till it's at a comfortable level. Oh, that's, that's such a great way to avoid over EQing. Yeah. And teaching yourself how to use your ears. Add, remove, replace. We should probably also mention you want to have your cue really, uh, really steep. You know, yeah, and, and then really, really surgical. Sharp so you're cut. Not, yeah. yeah, so you're not raising a bunch of frequencies exactly. at once. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely tighten up the cue. So another thing I like to do, um, I try not to over compress the 808, and I think this is where a mm -hmm. lot of people get into trouble. Most 808s will have like a natural fade out or a decay, and if you compress them too much, everything comes at uniform volume. Yeah. Um, so you end up having to have the vocal compete with a really loud bass for the whole bar. Just kind of sticks in there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't yeah. go away. And it also, it makes it sound less loud because there's no point of reference. And I think it becomes a little uh, too digitized. It loses like the natural essence of that sound. The character. Yeah, the character. Absolutely. Over compression, I think in general does that. Um, but when we're talking about that trouble spot with vocals, that's that's something I see all the time. We have this tendency to be like, the bass sounds good. Let me compress the hell out of yeah. it and make it louder. But now your voice can't cut through. I think a good example of over compression is uh, that last Flying Lotus record. Which one? The album or the, the last album. single? The oh album. wow! Yeah, I over think I think he over compressed. I mean, like he probably does that on purpose to really get that like crazy, just like bounce between heavy and light. You know? Yeah, like the heavy side chain compression sound. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something to taste. I agree with that. I, I kind of like things sounding a bit yeah. more natural. Uh, shout to Flying Lotus, though. No, not. No, not. Ain't no not hate, hating. Bro. We promise. Nah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the last thing I like to do, I, I do 808 tricks. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later when we discuss saturation. But I do um, I do a lot of multiband distortion. Yeah. Um, and I'll distort like the mid range of the bass because that has the same root note as Absolutely. the low end. It has the same pitch, but it's not competing with the low end. Exactly. So you can trick the person's ear to think the bass sounds louder. When they're really just hearing like the high harmonics, definitely and that gives you room for that vocal to sit down. Bottom. Definitely, I, I, I add a little uh, sometimes some like bit crunch, absolutely to the mid or even the the high. I guess there is really no higher end of the bass, but yeah, the higher spectrum of the mid. Yeah, um, if you can really split your chain up, you know, have that low end kind of really bring the low end to the center and then crunch out the mids. Yeah, you'll start to get some good separation. Definitely. It's about that perceived mix when you're doing that lo-fi stuff. You know, it, it sounds louder in the mid, so it is louder in your ear. Definitely. Dope. So thank you, Greg, for that question. That was a good one. Oh, reverb. Hmm. Go on. Reverb between the vocal and the bass will give you a lot more space as well. Very, very if good. If you point. cut some of the high on, you know, add some reverb to your vocal, cut a little of the high back, cut a little low back, really focusing on that mid-range reverb. Um, and if your bass, 
I mean, I sometimes add reverb to my bass. Well, tiny, <laughs> tiny, 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 bit. tiny bit just to give it some atmosphere. But like, you can really start to separate frequencies with reverb. Absolutely, reverb and short delays. Yeah, delays. Word. Thank you, Greg. You opened up a world of discussion. Clearly, hell yeah, Greg. So we'll do. Uh, we'll take one more question. This one was from Amy from Los Angeles, California. Hello, Amy. Hello. Uh, she asks, with producers becoming artists on their own, what advice do you have for up and comers looking to make a career out of their beats? Hmm. Um. My first recommendation, especially if you're you're going the producer on your own route, is to develop a really strong live show. Absolutely. Um, it's the only way to make consistent money nowadays, and it does the double duty of making you visible. Um, but even in the studio, you'll start to produce music that you can perform live and be excited about, and I think that's the best kind of music. You know, it becomes a little complicated because it, when you're going to produce and make beats, you're kind of not stuck in the world, but you want to be you know, fluent with what's modern and what actually makes sense with the other music that's going on right now. So you do not, you don't want to just come out making some crazy, like no one's really going to vibe with it because they're on this kind of wave. Mm. They're on like a certain wave. So in order to really make yourself unique within that wave, I think is the live show. Absolutely, bro. That's well said. Um, I think the other big thing that I'm seeing skipped a lot is building with, uh, and you kind of touched on it just now, but building with other producers and communities. Yeah. Mainly for that reason, to get yep. a pulse and an idea as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. We have this tendency of locking ourselves in front of our equipment, and it's cool to experiment that way, but you don't get a frame of reference that way. I think it's also important, I hate saying this to people, but it's it's the sad truth nowadays. Look somewhat more professionally at your current social media if yeah. you want to be a, especially a gigging producer. Mm -hmm. um, it's your reach, it's your brand. If you're the type of person that doesn't like that sort of thing, there's tools like Hootsuite where you can dedicate 20 or 30 minutes a day and get your whole campaign scheduled for the day. Um, but in this producer scene, especially where your target demographic is 15 to 30 and male usually, they're all online. Your target yeah. audience is on the internet. Definitely. So you have to you have to kind of embrace that in one way or another and find how you're comfortable in doing that. Yeah, I think it's good to kind of bounce between, you know, creating a cult following with your live performance while maintaining the uh, attention span of your online audience. True. It becomes a validator on both sides. Yeah. Cool. And the last thing I guess I would recommend, um, linking up with someone who loves to do video. Yeah. You know, it's... Again, it's an ADD generation. Video is so, so, so important. And you're busy producing. I understand that. That's what you should be doing. So find someone that likes to shoot, that likes to edit. Um, partner up and offer music services. Offer yep. to mix and master their video work. That is a serious, serious task for, for, uh, for engineers and for videographers. Um, offer to trade background music. But just make sure you're putting something on YouTube and on social media that moves and has sound. It's absolutely vital in that industry. Yeah. Some people get to a point that some producers get to a point where they just want to start handing out beats. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bad idea. I do too. It's it a bad idea. It devalues your beats. Absolutely. And you never know. Like Maybe you hand this beat off to somebody without really having the right paperwork or the right agreement. And that beat takes off and... Kanye's back on your name like Kanye got your beat down yeah <laughs> a lot of I mean a lot of folks you know argue against that and say it's you got to get your feet wet and pay your dues but I'm a big fan of being informed like yeah. you don't have to pay dues if you're informed yeah exactly and you know you don't want you don't want that one hit that you had that one chance at a hit that you had to go to nothing because you didn't take care of your paperwork yep I think if you set some goals for yourself and just start, you know, really nose to the ground, grinding on those goals. These things that you want to happen will naturally start happening because that's the path you're on. For sure. You know, goals are a big point. Yeah. We often just kind of freeform and make stuff. But I mean, sense here. What would you write? Like over 100 beats last month or something? It was some ridiculous like, month. <laughs> but that's just goals. I mean, you're doing like five a you day. Know, you're you like, know? you got to do five a day. And yeah. then a month's over and you did five a day. Exactly. All right. I'm ready to talk about some mixing. <laughs> The first thing I wanted to talk about, right out of the bat, compression. Compression. Compression gets confused by a lot of people. So just as a basic definition, the compressor reduces the dynamic range of a signal. Um, so it squashes the signal so the louder peaks get a bit tamed and the overall volume of the signal is more even. Mm -hmm. So if you got something that was recorded and it goes loud and quiet, a compressor is the way to kind of smush that together. Um, so whenever a signal reaches the volume that's set at the compressor's threshold, threshold. that compressor will kick in. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 
call your compressor this guy that works in a factory, right? The threshold is the alarm going off. Say, hey, dude, it's time for you to work. It's time for you to kick in. The time in which he hears that alarm and then he actually does his job, he really kicks in, that's the attack. That's the attack of your threshold, of your right. compression. Okay. So I wanted to spend a lot of time here talking about attack because that's a really big way to get a lot of shaping out of your compressor without dialing into crazy ratios and Definitely. settings like that. Um, right off the bat, when you're compressing your drums, I think a lot of people have the attack really quick. And what that does, the compressor kicks in right at the initial transient of your drum. So you yeah. squash the first hit of your drum. Yeah. So something that I do, I turn my attack completely to the right. Mm. And then I slowly start to turn it left and I look for the gain reduction to kick That's in. That's that same technique, add, remove, add, replace. Remove. Exactly. It's a great way to train your mm -hmm. ears. Um, but you can kind of monitor when the compression starts to kick in. And you'll be surprised at how gentle you start to use yeah. attack on your drums. Um, so... If you're finding that you lose your transients when you compress your drums, roll off of that attack right from the jump. Yep. Now, conversely, if you want to soften your drums, if you want to soften the transients, a lot of people go to EQ, but squashing with your compressor, having a really fast attack is a way to do that yeah. too. Um, a lot of us are trying to get that kind of like 40 subdued drum sound out of percussion. Mm -hmm. So really squish them with your compressor, your compressor and really, really have a fast attack. And that'll muffle the harshness of those transients and kind of even out the drums a little bit. Definitely. I think one, one mistake people make is, uh, you know, they'll put a compressor on their track and don't even realize that it's not even being used. Yeah. You know, like they'll be like, yeah, I got the compression going. It's like, really, you haven't even touched the threshold. Yep. Your attack is either so far left or right that it's really having no effect at all. Yep. So it's really important to make sure that you're paying attention to if your compressor is even doing its job. Absolutely. I think it's hard to train your ears to hear it. I, to this day, sometimes I have difficulty hearing the, the finest nuance of compression. Yeah. So use the meters. Yep. Really keep an eye on gain reduction. That's the biggest thing that exactly, I look for. Exactly, gain reduction. Once that gain reduction meter starts moving, I start to get really gentle with my touches. Yeah. So, you know, use your eyes and then close your eyes and really listen to what's happening so you start to internalize it. Um, so let's talk about the drum bus. So uh, we've got the, the entire collection of all of our drums together. And a lot of times we have a difficulty preserving the punch but opening everything up. This is where I like to use multiband compression. Yeah. Um, a multiband compressor allows you to compress the different frequencies of a signal differently. It's almost like parallel compression. Exactly. But within... But within frequencies. Exactly. So, you know, you can give your low end a different set of settings than your high end. In order to preserve punch from the kick and the low sounds from the snare, that's really the groove and the gel of everything. I often recommend using that slow attack that we talked about before. Yeah. Because that'll make sure that the punch of those hits really sits through. While on the higher frequencies, you can use a much faster attack because mm -hmm. that'll kind of soften some of those hard hi-hat hits, some of the brilliance, and allow you to spread the frequency up a little bit. Now, to get everything sitting back together again, I'll put a glue compressor on at the end. Yeah. And now you've got a really, really wide stereo mix. Definitely. So uh, I, I preach the importance of bus compression a lot. That's something I learned later in my career as an engineer. Once you have a general sound put together on that bus, really take a look at a multiband option and, and decide what you want to drive the mix. More often than not with drums, you want that low end driving the mix first. Yeah. So that's what gets your punchy compression settings. Glue compressor, I love those things. Yeah, the, the, the SSL. The SSL compressor is always yeah. a go-to. Um, but even if you can't grab an SSL, if you're a live user, the glue compressor in live is really, really solid. It's actually modeled after the SSL. Is it? The glue compressor, yeah. Well, Not the regular compressor, just yeah, the glue. Just the glue one. Well, and, that, the, and the new one. That makes, like, that makes a lot of goddamn sense. Yeah. It's great for drum buses. It's great for the overall mix, too. Yeah. I use it on my, I use it on like all my kicks and my uh, bass. Word. And my subs. Uh, I also like feeding the, uh, the side chain into yeah. the glue compressor for the subs especially. Definitely. Tight. So the last thing... And I kind of wanted to talk about with compression is to not use it so goddamn much. Yeah. Um, let your shit breathe. Let, let your music breathe, firstly. And secondly, remember that compressors were used to fix the problem of volume inconsistencies. Yeah, exactly. Before we had DAWs. Mm -hmm. We have DAWs now. You can literally go in and nudge the automation of your volume up and down. If something's too low, turn it up. Turn it up, yep. Um, and, you know, it's, it's usually quicker to grab a compressor. 
but you're going to get a much better mix if you literally go there and riot the faders, so to speak. Yeah. So, you know, I... That's kind of like an after-the-fact motion, I think. You know, like, once you have a full mix going, you kind of go back and listen, like, all right, this is a little too loud here, this is a little too soft Absolutely. here. Absolutely. I wouldn't really zoom in so much while you're in, still in the, you know, twiddling phases. Absolutely. Um, once you have a lot, a nice set mix that you're pretty comfortable with, then you could really kind of fine tune riding your fader. Absolutely. So yeah, use your compressor smart. Don't use it too goddamn much. Yeah. Treat it like your lady. Touch and, her gently. And I think another cool thing to do is using the side chain without actually compressing the sound too much. Just a subtle side chaining. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone has a tendency to just go all or nothing with that nowadays. Yeah, no, you could totally sidechain without, like, actually compressing your sound. Yeah. Uh, especially in Ableton Live. Yeah, just like a, a gentle a gentle ratio on your sidechain. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of duck. Um, yeah. Just use it as duck, basically. Or even a more extreme one, and then you come down on that dry wet. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, to me, that's the best tool in a, in a sidechain compressor. That is essentially is parallel compression. It's a New York compression. Yeah, right on the one knob. Dope. Let's move this thing on to EQ tips. E to the Q. Gotta get these EQs. <laughs> so the first thing that I learned and like really internalized with EQ was to high pass damn near everything. Yep. Um, the kick and the bass, for the most part, I won't high pass. Sometimes I will do a little bit of low filtering on the bass. I almost always let the kick sit center and full. I usually use a spectrum to find exactly what megahertz that kick drum is hitting at. Like, yep. what is the hardest, what's the heaviest point of that low end? Yep. And then I just crop it there. Interesting. Yeah. So you do a full isolation. I'll do a full isolation. I've seen that on some of your kick drums, too. Mm -hmm. And it gives you this really kind of, like, round, like, yeah. clean, punchy kick. Yep. Uh, Daniel Wyatt actually talks about this this style of cutting, mm -hmm. and he he's, his wording is that it uses the speakers more efficiently. I think it gives you a better chance at layering your kick drums because mm. if you have something really low and kind of bassy, and you see it's at like you know forty hertz, and you just isolate it at like thirty eight. Yeah. So I I don't it may not necessarily like be right at the decimal. Yeah. I'll give it a couple hertz. Um, to let it, you know, give it some room to come in. But I'll really start to isolate those kicks because I know I'm going to layer. When you're dealing with low end, it's really easy to think that you have room that you don't. Yeah. So any tricks you can get to kind of clear up real estate down low, you kind of have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so with regard to just high passing the other instruments, you'd be surprised at how much low end energy you don't need out of instruments. Like yeah. the next time you're mixing your hi-hats, if you don't do this already, kind of solo them and then do a high pass filter. Yep. And see how far up you can go before you're really affecting the pitch and the tone of that cymbal. A yep. lot of times you can get up to the five, six, seven hundred range exactly. before you're doing any damage to the overall sound. Yeah, I mean really like, you know, throw on that high pass, drag it all the way to your low end and gradually drag it over to your high until yep. you start to hear a difference. And and doing that, you know, it may seem like it's tedious and pointless, but that's all room that you freed up for the other instruments. Yep. So the less stuff that's down there muddying up the mix, the more your kick drum sounds present, the more your snare sounds present. High pass everything. Which also would help out Greg with the vocal. True. Low vocal, low bass True. situation. True. Mm -hmm. Get all of the other instruments the hell out of the way. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, so something else that I, I like to do, and this, this is actually another Daniel Wyatt trick. Um, I use a chain that follows subtractive EQing, mm. compression, and then boosting EQ. Okay, yeah. So in the first EQ, there's no boosting at all. That's strictly to get rid of frequencies that we don't need. Mm -hmm. And we feed that into the compressor so we can have the most appropriate signal to noise ratio. Right. All you, the muds gone. You want to get out those annoying artifacts. You want to get all those creepy, like pitchy, annoying things out of the way first. Absolutely. And honestly, to take it a step further, I'm, I'm trying to deal with leveling issues then, too. Yeah. You know, if if my bass is too, too muddy, I'm cutting there, obviously. But if I want to get a high more present, then maybe I'm cutting at the bass, too. I really try to not fix things by adding anymore. Yeah. So by the time you get out of the compressor and you're at your boosting EQ, it's more for color. It's more for sizzle. It's kind of like add. seasoning. You can actually add. Yeah. Instead I, of just adding mush. Yeah. 
I'm huge on subtractive EQing. That's like all I do. I yeah. just take away, take away, take away. And that's that. Add, take away, replace. Well, you have a really, like, you know, in, in, in digging in your mixes more and digging in your sessions more, you have a lot of instruments in the mid range and yet everything's still really clean. Yeah. And I think that's probably how you're able to get that. Subtractive. It's, I just find that one piercing artifact within a sound and i completely take it out of the situation and i've literally seen like your eq just cut to the floor yeah just take a complete but the, but the, the quality the cue is very very sharp so so sharp like super thin and it's interesting like if you solo and unsolo it like you you can hear why you do it it makes a lot of sense yeah so yeah cut 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 do not boost unless you absolutely have to um i also like using mid side eq a lot especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about drum buses and, and buses in general. Mid-side EQs, this goes back to what Liam was talking about with parallel processing. Your EQ is split into two sections. You can EQ the middle of your frequencies and then you can EQ what's on the extreme left and right, the sides. Mm -hmm. um, so to widen the mix on the sides, I'll add a lot of air. Oh, I'll, yeah. add a, I'll add a lot of high frequencies and I'll cut the low end on the sides. And I do that because low end frequency, groove, rhythm, pulse, drums, you want that centered. Absolutely. So that center EQ is where I'll, I'll kind of pronounce those frequencies. But I don't want that showing up on the sides at all. No. So if you combine kind of splitting the sides and then boosting the highs in the side and then kind of cutting those highs in the center, you get this really separated but wide drum mix. Yeah, definitely. This is also really good for vocals too. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about ad lib vocals, especially, I'll I'll take the sides and I'll, I'll boost the living hell out of them. Yeah, just to give you that kind of because you end up panning most of that stuff anyway. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about with EQing really quick, master your stock EQ. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people will try to bounce around and get the next plug in. Oh, this one was used by my favorite producer, so I got to get this. And you don't really allow yourself to learn the color of each EQ that you have. Yeah. You know, take a week and only use Live's EQ. Take a week and only use Logic's built-in EQ, so on and so forth. And you start to pick up the individual characteristics of everything. One major difference I noticed between the Live EQ and the Ableton EQ is that uh, the Ableton EQ stops around 30 hertz on the low end. And the uh, Logic EQ ends at about 20 hertz on the low end. Interesting. So, which is one other reason why uh, sometimes we don't always recommend doing your final mix in Ableton Live. Yeah. Because within those stock EQs, um, you're not able to reach some of those super low frequencies that you may not even really be able to hear, but you're at least able to manipulate them. And feel. And feel. You could feel them more than you can hear them, absolutely. I mean, I would definitely say that logic is favored in like the dub communities yeah in the dubstep communities where that low end is of utmost importance yeah and that's probably why that's why welcome back to lab science the number one podcast covering music production business songwriting and studio technique if you haven't already follow us on twitter at lab science pod and on instagram at lab science podcast i am professor sense Captain Lean Automatic. And we're talking about mixing tips that you can start to implement. The next thing I wanted to discuss really quickly is panning. Um, I feel like we overlook how how strong the process of panning can be towards scoping your final sound. Hell yeah. Um, you often talk about, you know, some people mix extreme left, right. Some people do this, that, and the third. But one thing I'm not hearing enough is using panning automation to really mm. push the arrangement of the song forward. Yeah. Um, so, for example, I personally will pan automation changes during the hook. You did some crazy panning automation in the last track in the Rooftop. Lily, I just want your diamonds. That shit was, oh my God, it was great. Well, it's, it's one of those things where it's your chance to move shit around. So it, yeah. it kind of jerks your body back and forth. But Absolutely. You know, for example, let's, let's talk about an ad lib vocal. Yeah. Um, I might have an ad lib vocal pan to two o'clock during the verse. And then when the hook kicks in, we'll pan it to four o'clock. It widens bring it out, everything yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And then you bring it back into two after the verse comes in. This kind of automation, it's, it's an ear trick. It's a head trick. You, yeah. you make a widening and then a, a narrowing, depending on what the verse is doing. Especially when you're in the car. Yeah. You got a car. 
you're gonna be sitting there like looking around like where the hell that awesome feeling the- <laughs> there's nothing better than like yeah. like when you hear a really deep IDM mix and mm-hmm. something moves around the whole damn car and everyone in the car is like whoa what where the hell is that coming from it's the same exactly. concept for sure another thing that I really can't stress enough pan before you raise volume on things yeah you know pulling something from center to extreme left or extreme right it makes it more present depending on your mix definitely especially with like leads Mm -hmm. um you know even rhythm rhythms certain uh, chord progressions that you have or just like weird stuttery kind of clickety clackety sounds that you may do definitely pan that stuff instead of just raising the volume yeah. on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is something I, I do even subtly with snare drums. Snare drums, I uh, was told to always, always, always stereo claps, stereo snares, always put them left and right. Absolutely. Um, a lot of folks will center. You get a lot of blowback on this. Mm-hmm. A lot of folks will just center their snare. Out of here. Get out of here. You get that sound right. Great for you. Yeah. I try to make sure that I have a really solid center, but then left and right, I have some type of weird panning going on. Yeah. Even it if it's subtle. It doesn't have to be extreme. It can be a little bit, but uh, I was told, you know, by a couple heavier hitting dudes in the studio, like, check the difference mm. when we put your snares to your ears instead of like at your nose. Mm. Especially when you come, I mean, like, you know, obviously a snare and a kick drum aren't really going to compete with frequencies, but... Um, it just gives you a little more air. Yeah. And I feel like you can get your snares louder. I agree. When they're like kind of stabbing you in the ear instead of smacking you in the face. I agree. That's a that's a great way of like making the image. Yeah. Kind of point it to the ears instead of to the nose. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the uh, you know, Ilmine, the producer. Mm-hmm. One of the things that at least I hear in a lot of his his uh, his snares and his claps, he'll have a centered snare and then he'll pan hard left and hard right, either different snares or different claps. Yeah, yeah. Especially with claps. Definitely with claps. Snares you can kind of get away with, I think. Mm -hmm. But the clapping, yeah, you want to separate that. It makes this huge kind of panorama every time the snare hits. Yeah. You can also do that left-right trick. You know, you can center the snare and then have left-right percussive elements. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, you can have a snare or clap and then duplicate that same snare and clap and have one, you know, like 34 on the left or like uh, 28 on the right. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's not exactly, you still get some of that mid, you know, right in the middle of your face sound, but it's also a little bit to the left, a little bit more to the right, or a little bit more to the left, you know, vice versa. Yeah, there's more width there Mm -hmm. without losing the power. Exactly. It's awesome. You know, something I've been doing, this is an old school trick, so all the old heads are going to are gonna laugh at introducing it, but I should mention it for the younger cats. Since we've been tracking a lot more guitar, running the same part in two different tracks. Yeah. And then panning hard left and hard, hard right. right. Oh, yeah. There's it's your a, stereo. It's a beautiful sound. Yeah. And with so many people getting into uh, to modular synths, um, with getting into software synths even, yeah. take a second and either make a sequence and then run through it twice and kind of play with your, you know, play with the knobs differently on each sequence and then pan them. Do some modulating it. Or just physically play the same part twice and then pan them hard against each other. Yeah. And, you know, you get the same tone, but since there's that subtle variation, it widens and moves everything. I mean, this is really just all about getting stuff out of the way for your low end because your low end, it gets compromised so quickly. Mm -hmm. Way faster than your high end, I think. I like to look at at it as like a point system, you know, with with everything as far as compression, EQing, panning, whatever it may be. You want to give yourself points at the end so that you can add on to your mix. So you can actually mix and master your sound. So if you're taking away, taking away, you know, take some away from the low end, take a bunch away from the high end of different sounds, different frequency ranges, you have space to add. Well said, sir. Thanks. <laughs> it's kind of on the same wavelength that you were talking about, but balancing. Balancing, yep. Um, balancing, getting those levels at the right state for you. And a lot of times, this is the first thing I do. I know we kind of went out of order here, but balancing, I feel like, needs to be done at a lower level than people are doing currently. Yeah. Um, when you're getting that first uh, that first balance between all your tracks, it's really easy to think something sounds better than it does if you turn it up loud. Yeah. And then the rest of your mix is compromised based on that. So I find that if, if I mix, or at least if I level at the lowest volume that I can handle first, I get a much more accurate leveling situation when I turn it up. Definitely. I mean, 
you see my mixes, they're like super low. Mm -hmm. If you turn everything off, they're like, you got to turn your volume all the way up. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I thought I was giving myself a lot of headroom in live and I started getting your sessions and I would see like six to eight dBs. Yeah. And at first I was like, damn, where am I going to get all the rest of the gain from? But then you, you, you start to add in compression. You yep. start to add in your mastering before plugins, you know it. And you give them room to work. Yep. You're you know? almost at, you're almost back at infinity before you even know it. Yeah. So especially with live, maybe it, it goes down to that, that uh, different EQ frequency engine that it has. But I find that you have to give yourself a lot more headroom. Mad headroom. So, you know, I, I kind of going back to that Daniel Wyatt school of mixing. Shout out to Daniel. But I try to find an anchor when I'm mixing in live. Usually the yeah. kick. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. It's usually the kick drum. <laughs> usually the kick drum. Maybe a kick and vocal, depending on what I'm mixing. Yeah. Um, and I try to get those to hit around that 6 to 8 dB from the jump. Yeah. And then everything else that I start to level in, I reference to that kick. Mm -hmm. You really want to pick what's going to drive the mix first and then balance against that. Absolutely. You know, a lot of folks do the fader is up trick. That's not my move. No. I really like having a set anchor before I start to do yeah, that. Yeah. If I see red anywhere throughout, at any point throughout my mixing, I turn the shit down. For sure. Because when it comes to that final mix and final master, then we can maybe start adding some peaking but i don't want to have any i don't want to see red anywhere where gain staging is important yeah so another thing i like to do you know obviously with balancing you want to reference on multiple systems if you can you want to reference in mono for sure yeah absolutely because um, <laughs> speakers be crapping out all over the place speakers crap out all the time <laughs> most clubs even if they have 50 speakers it's multiple mono setups yeah um and you have a mono speaker in your pocket right now, your phone. Phone is most mono. Yeah, so most people are going to hear your stuff on that device at least once. Um, so definitely set your leveling in mono. If you're using some extreme panning like we were talking about before, this is of the utmost importance. Yeah. Um, but another thing that I like to do is reference on multiple systems outside of the main range of the speaker cone. Yeah. So I'll step away from the room. Maybe I'll walk into an adjacent room with the door slightly wedged open. Yep. And I find that inconsistencies tend to stand out a bit more for whatever reason when you yeah. do that. Especially when you're talking about bass. Yeah. Because you're not actually going to feel it until you take a step back. Yes. If you're sitting at your station, at your desk or whatever, you know, if you're sitting in the cockpit and you got the speakers at the, the tweeters right at your ears, you're not going to catch that bass. You really got to step back yeah. to feel it. Definitely. And, you know, it's, it's a good... It's a good reminder of yourself every every 40 minutes or every 30 minutes or so to kind of walk around anyway. Yeah. So use that as your reason to check those levels in a different setup. Yep. Same thing goes for a car. You know, if you can shoot a mix to your phone and go check it in the car real fit, real fast, go for it. Yeah. You know, it, cars is the best place. In my you opinion. used to have to do a test bounce. Now we can airdrop this stuff. Mm -hmm. There's no reason not to test your leveling the whole way through. All right, man. So we've got things kind of balanced out a bit. We talked a lot about compression. This is an effect that I love and hate. I'm talking about reverb and delay effects, time-based effects. Yeah. I personally think these effects date your music more than anything if you use them wrong. Yeah. Think about gated reverb in the 80s. Um, <laughs> but one thing that I've noticed a lot, a lot of producers and artists are hiding, hiding maybe lack of instrumentation or whatever behind a wall of reverb. Yeah. Um, so we're often getting these these mixes that have five different reverbs on the bus. There's already a wall of sound. And you're trying to make elements stand out using what? Reverb, right? Reverb, yep. So in order to skip that, I think it's really important to introduce yourself to Slap Echo. Yeah. And Slap Echo is kind of a lost art in new producers. Slap Echo was really popularized by the Beatles. It's how you get mm. a lot of that warmth before you even talk about the transistors. Yep. And basically, you're talking about a really, really short delay with one or two repeats. When I say short, you know, something between 70 and 100 milliseconds short. Yeah. And it that, really comes back. It comes back. Almost like those dub snares. Absolutely. But less feedback. But less feedback. <laughs> you get all of that kind of hugging space and that little bit of warmth like you're putting something into a room without throwing it into reverb, which then gets muddy. Yeah. So if you've got a mix, you know, let's say you've got a vocalist and the instrumentation already has all this stuff going to reverb and you're trying to get that space in the vocal, start with a slap delay. Again, that's, yeah. you know, one or two repeats, 70 to 100 milliseconds in your time, and you're good to go. And one thing, you know, keep in mind, if your song sounds like shit and you put, <laughs> <laughs> and 
and you put reverb on it, it's going to sound like shit with reverb on it. You can't polish a turd. You can't. So another thing I love doing, again, automating. Um, I automate reverb, delay, sends all the time, especially with yeah. relevance to the song arrangement. Sends, especially. Yep. Sends so, are huge. So, you know, I'll often have a delay or a verb that only opens up during the chorus. Or I'll use a different set of reverb and delay chains for the bridge to really kind of put you in a different room really quickly. Yeah. Um, it's also a great way to create anticipation. Mm-hmm. To create, like, suspense almost. Yep. Adding, 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 and then dramatically taking away. And if you if you automate even the bypass, you can get really weird kind of cutting effects. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a whole new world that opens up when you start thinking about the automation as a part of the song arrangement. In this field where uh, a lot of people are using, like, swells, mm-hmm. or they'll, they'll do the trick where, you know, you go from, like, eighth claps to 16th to 30 seconds to 64th to create this, like, anticipation for a drop. Yep. Another great way to avoid falling into that same lane that everyone rides in is by automating your sends with some crazy delay or crazy reverb and increasing increasing then dropping it yeah it's a much more natural like dramatic build yeah and i think that rolling like hi-hat yeah the rolling so fucking dated like you see it coming from my, I'm yeah done. i'm so done with it yes yeah, it's, it's tired <laughs> <laughs> and it's cheesy as hell it is it is. i mean some people do it well i shouldn't bash no nah. a lot of genres still do it but Find another way to build that anticipation. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. That's a DJ technique, though. Tep, definitely. DJ like, I've heard you use that with, like, a Pioneer mixer. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Hell yeah. But Taking I, it to your home. Um, another thing that I like to do with reverb, instead of swelling, like you said, with one big lush field, use two subtle reverbs chained into each other. Yeah. Um, and furthermore, if you really want to push that movement... Add a slight LFO in the dry wet of them. Hell yeah. So now you get this different balance of the reverbs feeding one or another. That convolution reverb. Good point. Match yeah. up a plate reverb with, you know, a convolution spring reverb. You that, start getting all these different tones. Yeah, that Max for Live convolution where you can kind of do one type of reverb on your early reflection versus mm-hmm. another on your uh on your late on your late reflection. Yeah. It's huge. So again, it's it's really about I think the the kind of rule of thumb today has just been subtlety. You know, rather yeah. than trying to get extreme results out of one thing, how do you spread that across different things? And with the reverb, you absolutely have to do that. Push a spring into a plate and see what happens. Um, so future bass, since we're kind of on that subject, it's really, really reverb heavy, but it requires like a really, really strong center. Ah, oh, so there's a good chance to pan your reverb. It's a good chance to pan your reverb. If you're a live user, it's a great chance to use the utility tool. Mm-hmm. And use the widen uh, yeah. aspect of that tool or any stereo widener for that matter. And what that does is it takes the reverb and puts it more on the left and right of the cones. While again, that center is reserved for your kick, for, for your snare, yeah. and for your lead vocal. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to do this, again, checking in mono is, is really, really important. But this is also a good way to make things sound huge while using less reverb. I find that the more that things are spread to the left and the right, the less of the sound I have to use, the less volume yeah. I have to use on the bus. Mm-hmm. It kind of isolates. You know, if you look at, you know, if I have 16 tracks in one of my productions and you look across the pan knob, it's like almost like a rainbow. Mm. It's almost like a fan where it'll literally fan from like absolute left to absolute right. Yeah. Depending on the instrument. Hit all those spots in between. Mm-hmm. This is the best way to have a full mix. And I mean, it's you don't know what kind of system you're going to be on. So my thing is be clean at every frequency and be clean at every like section of the stereo. Pan. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and then, you know, when you start adding uh, like a slap delay that kind of yep. slaps between your left and right. If you have something panned all the way left. And then you're throwing the delay to the right. That's really going to start bugging out your listener. Like, what is going? Like, where is this coming from? Yeah, just gives it more character. I think it's an old dub technique. Yeah. And one other last last thing that I love doing with reverb delay lately, especially, uh, I'll do side chain compression on the reverb bus. Mm-hmm. So you know, you send the kick and the snare maybe to a compressor on that bus, and every time your kick hits in, the reverb just disappears a, bit. a little bit. Yep. De- the delay ducks a little bit. That's dope. And that's how you get that space. You can keep it really wide and atmospheric, but yeah. everything goes out of the way. It's the really drum. easy to get muddy mm-hmm. with delays and reverbs. Yep. Or just maybe not even muddy, but just lose the essence of the sound, especially in like 
rhythm, you know, rhythmic chords or leads and things like that. It's easy to kind of lose the sound design that you created yeah. by adding too much reverb or delay. Yeah. Don't be afraid to post-process that reverb too. You know, if, if you've lost a lot, EQ it. If there's too much range, compress it after the reverb. Yeah. I think a lot of folks just stop. And you can take that final output and kind of mesh it to the way you want it to be. Yeah. I mean, I've ultimately I've learned to be a super tight ass with everything. Like, I don't want to add too much. I don't want to add too much. Because really, like, our tracks are kind of crazy. There's a lot going on. Yeah. It's not just, like, one lead, you know, drums and, like, a bass. It's like, we got clickety-clackety. We got, like, <laughs> You said clickety-clack, like, like, three times. Yo, right? clickety-clackety <laughs> stuff. We're like, tick, 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 tick. you know, we're doing all that crazy shit. So it's Ethiopian click music. Yeah. So you... <laughs> Shouts to Ethiopia. <laughs> Shouts to Ethiopia, indeed. <laughs> oh, word. So last thing I want to talk about, probably the most important in this current mixing market, saturation, distortion, bit reduction. Hell yeah. Grittying up the signal. Something that you really got me comfortable with, for sure. Um, right out of the bat, multiband distortion. People will often ask, how do I get movement on my bass lines? Mm. And that's usually the trick. Yeah. Um, Especially with sine bass, if you run different types of distortions on different frequencies, they react at different times. Yeah. So they might clip earlier, clip later, fold over earlier or later, and you get this movement That's in crazy. your sub bass. There's a really great plugin uh, called Sub Boom Bass, and I use that for probably half of my bass stuff. Right. Um, the reason being, they have the best multi band distortion I've heard in any plugin. Word. So you have full command over the type of distortion. You can use a fold over distortion and get that really like Travis Scott gnarly ripping sound. Yeah. Yeah. You can use sinoid distortion and get pure 808 kind of ranges. But it's important because when you have that multiband and you distort the mids again, they show up on shitty speakers. Yeah, that's another. Uh, I like. I kind of like to. Uh, what we were saying before is um, panning things when you play the same thing over. Yeah. So let's say I have a bass line. I'll actually go and find like a more higher end frequency sound, and play that exact same bass line. Yeah. So instead of uh, this is another way to kind of split your chains without actually splitting the chains you're just recording the same thing using different instruments at different frequency ranges layering layering that's also great for that rolling the dice you don't know what kind of speakers you're getting so yeah. if they don't reproduce the low and at the very least you can hear the melody on the high instrument that yep. you matched it to i mean as long as you make sure you know your instruments are really tight with each other if you're trying to go that route I think it's an awesome way to add that movement, like you were saying, because then I could really start adding distortion to my higher end frequencies mm. and just let the low end ride do its thing. It gives the impression that the low end is the impression. Being, that's a great trick. That the bass is doing this, but really it's like some synth I made it on the S1 maybe. Right. You know, I'll have like, I do a lot of my sub work within Ableton Live and then do the other sounds um, externally. So I'll add the same exact key line for the bass, but just with like a higher end synth. That's smart. You know, for live users, if you don't have the luxury of having Lean's awesome synthesizer collection, you can also do that with an instrument rack. Do an instrument rack. Do use your uh, op use your uh, operator. Yep. And then go in and get your key, your electric keyboard or something like that, or even the analog. Yep. It's a great way to do it too. That's a that's a good one. I'm still on that as soon as we finish this podcast. <laughs> yeah. That's for damn sure. <laughs> um, you know, on the subject, the live, um, I think the new filters they introduced are the best thing live has done in a long time. Yeah. There's five different filter types. So for driving and distortion on a drum rack, for example, I'll have different filter types on each drum hit. And that allows you to send different types of distortion to That's every crazy. drum hit on the kit. And you talk so that's about every hit, not every instrument. Every hit. Wow. So your snare has a more Moog sounding filter on it. Your hi hats has the Prodigy filter on yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and that makes that separation in the field. Yep. But it also just sounds great when they're all driven. You it's know almost I mean? like a scaling process where you have a scale of sounds. Mm -hmm. 
ranging from harsh to less harsh or whatever. Yep. And you can kind of move throughout that freely yep. with each hit, with each transient almost. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, and this will probably round up our discussion for the day, iPhone and laptop speakers are here forever. They're here. They're garbage. They're garbage. <laughs> They're garbage. <laughs> Your way around that is using distortion. Yeah. Um, just the impression of something being gritty gives it the impression of being louder than it really is. Mm-hmm. So again, when we talk about layering up a you know a bass sound in the piano that you were talking about before, yeah. if I distort the hell out of that piano, mm-hmm. it sounds a lot louder and a lot deeper than it really is. Definitely, and that's how you trick you know an iPad, an iPhone, or a MacBook speaker into sounding a lot deeper than it really really mm-hmm. is. I think it's great, especially when you're using a glide. Mm. Like a portamento glide? Yeah, exactly. But twi- like, you know, a lot of newer bass heads like having that moving gliding sub. Yeah. Um, a way to approach that same feeling is by separating your low end and then having like a high end key sound and adding the glide to the high end. Huh. So all the distortion slides. All the distortion have- is sliding. And the bass will naturally just kind of melt in with it. It kind of sounds like it's moving with it. Yeah. Because if you have your low end lined up with your kick perfectly, and then you have your high end lined up with your sub perfectly, everything will just mesh. Because the uh, transient of the kick should really act as the transient of your sub. That's fucking genius. (laughs) All right, folks. I would wager that you have a couple of things that you can take back to your mix and implement. If you have any questions about anything that we went over, I want you to reach out to us on Twitter at Lab Science POD or Instagram at Lab Science Podcast. If it requires some long wording, hit up our email. That's Lab Science Podcast at gmail.com. Once again, I'm Professor Sense. I'm Captain Automatic. Until next time, you guys be well and take care of each other. Peace.